Welcome to Psychology to Live By, and today is a and a with some really interesting people, um, and our topic is Unimproving uh, Part 2, and our participants have watched the two podcasts of that name, and you can see or listen to them at my website, drchris.life. And I'll do a quick summary of Part 2 now before we jump into our Q&A. So in Part 1 of Unimproving, I took aim at the self-improvement industry, especially where it's founded on a deep category mistake, confusing our being with our doing. And we saw that our being or inherent nature can't be improved upon. And our skills, achievements and appearances, although very important, can't be the foundation of lasting happiness and self-regard. There's absolutely nothing wrong with improving knowledge and skills. In fact, I'd highly recommend it. Mastering skills and garnering knowledge is inherently exciting and satisfying. It provides joy when done for the right reason and when done in the right way. The grand delusion, the belief that there's something fundamentally wrong inside ourself, turns something potentially helpful into something terribly destructive. The essential point is that one should not pursue mastery in order to feel better about oneself, to bolster one's reputation or, or raise one's self-esteem. All of these things happen naturally as a byproduct when we do the opposite, when we forget ourselves, when we reduce self-consciousness and self-concern. So what I'm saying is that knowledge of this distinction between being and doing is enormously, enormously liberating when we apply it in the midst of setbacks and failures. We are already good enough to be loved by ourselves and by others. That insight is the foundation for the antidotes to this universal self-concern. So how we deal with this disabling negative self-esteem is we take the self out of it. So in this second podcast, I offer seven practical antidotes, and these include self-compassion practices, engaging in activities for the intrinsic pleasure involved, developing a stronger growth mindset, engaging in altruistic action, measuring self-performance against one's own benchmarks to give us a growing sense of mastery and healthy pride, dedicating time and effort to aesthetic appreciation, contemplation of nature and of beauty, and understanding your personality and then really accepting it and working with it. In summary, I think genuine happiness derives from the relative lack of self-concern. And the one thing I suggest you do in order to be happier is therefore to improve your unimproving. All right, so this brings us to my, my good friends. Um, and as always, uh, I'm impatient to find out what they felt about the podcast, what thoughts occurred to them, what questions. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it open as to who kicks this off. A nice start. Beautiful, Terry. I, I, I was struck by your quote saying, accept your personality, it's not going to change. Mm. Which I found really interesting because... Um, I think personalities do actually do change. I think they're affected by the environment that they're around, family, other like people. I've, I've, I've seen people take on personality traits of people that they love and that they come close to. So they've evolved. It's like a way of saying it. Um, so I, I, I just found that, I found myself thinking about that statement going, yeah, probably, but not from what I've seen. Yeah, well, we're gonna. Uh, we may end up agreeing to disagree here, Terry, but uh, uh, well, but maybe not. Let's see. I, I think one distinction that's very important is is the distinction between personality and character. You know, and there's a there's a saying. You know, quite a common saying that that you know certain experiences are, are character building, right? And so there's something built into the notion of character that 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 we build it over time. 
and and very often people use i think quite wrongly the, the terms character and personality interchangeably and they're quite distinct things so um the empirical evidence is against you terry in the sense of personality um that uh i love it when i'm an outlier <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's right you could be an outlier and, and, and right or an outlier and wrong but anyway um <laughs> Oh, <laughs> zing. I didn't say which you were, Terry. Um, no, but the point is, um, I think sometimes it looks like people are changing their personality. And I think there can be two things going on. One is this, this wiring in th through experience and practice of, of adaptations to the, to the environment around us, right? So people do take on characteristics of those around them, but it it probably doesn't change their underlying preference system, which is really what a personality is. The second thing is um, sometimes people's natural personality is somewhat inhibited because of environment. And then as they go through life, they gradually become more and more their, their innate personality. Um, so it can be a little confused in that way. There are some developmental changes as well that uh, often people point to as personality changes. So um, a complex question, this one, I don't think we're going to get to the bottom of it in this particular podcast, um, but it does, it does speak to the issue of unimproving in my view, in that I think a very important part of unimproving is accepting who we are and not, and not have this frenetic need to improve that personality, but to, to actually embrace it. Um, so I'll just live in my grand illusion. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to bite on that one, Terry. <laughs> who, who else? I think Terry brought up a good point previously um, when, when talking about self-help and, um, you know, when there are some issues that you can focus on it it allows you to take the attention away from yourself and you yes come at peace with yourself or the issue or whatever it is if you don't do that if you don't look into anything you know to educate yourself or to um to try to learn about yourself does it just does it naturally do you naturally just do you get worse? Do you get better? Do you hmm. make it? Are you when you you've got the blinders no. on and you don't want to deal with it? No, I, I understand. I think it was Socrates. He, he said the unexamined life's not worth living. Um, so I think um, the like many things. Like many things. I mean, there are people who are enlightened who've never, you know. Um, I'm sure read read a self help book, you know, th mm -hmm. th through the eons of history. So it, it's not that, but I think it, th we need to be thoughtful. Um, I, I guess one way of understanding this, Colin, is is we're trying to figure out how to be genuinely happy. You know, and what does that entail? Yeah. And if and if, and if you think about you know this this the self help you know industry, it it it's it 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 uh, profits off that universal desire, right? And um, but there can be a, mm, a, a a way we can get caught, and I think it's it's it goes something like this: uh, if we, it's like for example, if you're meditating, and let's say you're meditating in, in because you want to relax. You know, most meditation teachers will actually say that's probably not a good idea to have that as a purpose, right? But what happens then is you're constantly looking to see whether you're relaxed. And if you're not getting relaxed, you get more stressed, you know, and it becomes counterproductive. Um, and I think the self-help thing is, is, is the same. Am I getting better? Am I getting better? You know, if, if our purpose is to make self better, then a lot of the, our efforts are going to be counterproductive. So it, it's more like uh, this idea of if I can embrace something for the intrinsic pleasure of it, for the, for the joy of it, 
for the, you know. Um, now, of course, I'm a psychologist. Uh, I'm interested in ideas. I'm interested in reading all kinds of stuff about, you know, human beings. And I'm interested in, in applying that to myself. Uh, and one of the things I've found is that uh, my suffering, everyone's suffering, it, it all relates to this sense of there are deficits, deficits in myself, right? So there'll be a sub-branch of self-help books that will probably be more useful in that they'll take you down that avenue, right? The, I, I guess the, the ones I'm unhappy with are the ones that really celebrate a kind of sort of narcissistic, you know, outward achievement. Uh, you can make a million dollars, you know, or probably these days, you know, a hundred million, a billion dollars selling this. You can be anything you want to be sort of thing, right, um, which sort of set people up, up for failure. So, yeah, um, in my meandering answer, have I... Have I touched on your question? Absolutely. I mean, I think it comes down to balance. And, and I don't know why, but I, I identified or I compared it to the political climate and the, the extremes and the, the people on the right tend to be either side. Um, the people on the yeah. right tend to be, you know, they, they're not educating themselves about about some of the issues. And it's just when you don't, when you close yourself off to everything. Yes, it's just yeah, yeah. Make everything worse. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I, I think all of this hinges on this this word self. Um, you know, as I said, I'm all for improving skills and knowledge, and I think that's super important, but not in order to make one feel better about oneself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but oh. actually to, to live better. Yeah. yeah. All righty. Uh, that leaves two of you. <laughs> so... Um Oh, ah. go ahead. Oh. <laughs> um, does it is it right to say like sometimes it feels like this um, sense of self focus can be episodic, and mm. um, where you find yourself in moments where it seems to be especially bad, um, or especially yeah. maybe dominant is a better way of putting it, where it's really kind of grab the reins and there's almost like a lizard brain reaction there yeah you know what i mean where you mm -hmm. it can be hard to have your higher thinking self step in and say hold on a second like you, you you're you're really kind of going down a spiral here and what i found really interesting about this podcast is that you know those the, the techniques that you laid out and the ones that i've used in the past in particular like that that focus around self-compassion and mindfulness actually they're the hardest to do when you're in one of these episodes, even if you can like sit yeah. down and actually say, okay, I'm just going to like put everything aside and try to do a meditation or a mindful practice. Even in those moments, your brain is, seems to be actively fighting against you. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really, it's a really good insight, Chris. So um, this, this, may end up being a whole other podcast stream, you know, this, because um, the notion, like uh, another way of thinking about self, you know, a word that's often used is ego, right? And uh, and they're often synonymous. And uh, But I think that the, you know, the, the, there's a question about why is the ego or this sense of self so persistent? Right, as you say, and it can feel at times like you're at war with it, right? And yet, at other times, it's relatively absent. And uh, so, I think it does fluctuate quite a lot. And when it's, you know, when, for, if for whatever reason, when we're upset about something, it, it's often very then front of mind. And as you say, you you might try a self compassion approach to get rid of the upset to quieten down the self mm -hmm. and it can almost feel like it amplifies it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it, it is indeed a puzzle. And But I think that the, the answer uh, that most people give for this is finding a way to embrace or include the upset, to, 
to not try to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. It's the, the equanimity. Yeah, it, it, that's exactly what it is. This, yeah. this general okayness and allowing it to be. And, you know, it's, it's not as satisfying immediately as an answer that, you know, that then the absence of that mm -hmm. uh, turbulence would be. But ultimately that's what we have to learn to do is to make friends with it mm -hmm. and let it... And, I mean, just to jump to another sort of level here, I think um, most of the meditative traditions, and certainly this is a, a thread in contemporary neuroscience, is will distinguish between a, a general awareness or consciousness and the contents of consciousness. And everything shows up in consciousness. Mm. Every thought, all the ego stuff, all our feelings, all our sensations, emotions and so on. And there's a certain non-perturbed, sort of uh, untouched quality to consciousness. And it's, it's identifying more with that uh, rather than the contents. And, and, of course, a very important part of the contents of consciousness is this sense of self, right? Now, the other side of, of your, you know, typically complex observations uh, is, well, why would we have this? If it's such, such a problem, why would we all have it in the first place? And why is it a universal feature? And I think that... A simple answer to that would be it has, you know, uh, it's been selected for in, in, in evolutionary terms because it makes us look after ourselves. You know, it, it focuses on self-survival and self-advancement and so on and so on. So, of course, it's there. But evolution's not really concerned with our happiness. And so given... We now have an option in modern life to, to, to generate a different life purpose than the one that primarily runs our genes, you know, right, runs our DNA, etc. And that is that we can soften and loosen the bonds of the ego and self-concern and so on and, and pay more attention to this other dimension of our of our being, which is just this general okayness and equanimity. Yeah, very good, very good, Chris. Now, who does that leave? Does that does that leave you, Karen? Just me, just me. Yeah, <laughs> been waiting very patiently. <laughs> well, there a lot of this just landed with me, and I found it really interesting. And I think kind of um, I might be going down the same vein that Chris was talking about, but like, I feel like it's a constant this unimproving it's a constant practice that will change yeah. as you go through different events of your life and th there'll be different iterations of what it what it looks like um and so it it like when i think about it personally like you know you could be trucking along and like everything's great i'm being myself i'm showing up something happens and then instantly going to that oh i'm not good enough and why, what do I need to improve? And why am I, why am I not good enough in this situation? And so it's just like, then the antidotes really landed here, uh, specifically number five, and that's self-performance, self-performance against your own benchmarks. And like, I think that's something I'll continue to come back to is like, stop comparing yourself to other people, stop going to that, why am I not good enough in those situations in life? And where are you today? And what are those like, steps that you can take that will just un, not an improvement but get you to a little bit better place tomorrow does that make sense <laughs> yeah it does it does and there's a couple of uh things i want to say about that um you know as uh, there is a tendency i think as we get older and hopefully wiser uh, though that's not inevitable um that we do let go of more things you know, we don't sweat the small stuff as much. We might come to more accept ourselves. All right. So I think there's a there is a progression, even though it's like a stock market trend, lots of ups and downs, but there can be a sort of upward trend uh, if we you know live an examined life. Um, but there's another thing in what you were saying there, and that is um, when we. Uh, 
it, it, it's a strange kind of thing. You, 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 you mentioned sort of you get disappointed in yourself and you say, how can I improve? And uh, I think here, here's something that's important. And, and that is uh, when we examine, and I think we should examine, let's say we've upset someone or we've done something we're not proud of. We've behaved in a way that doesn't, doesn't fit with our, our moral standards or, or whatever. You know, we feel guilty, for example. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't feel whatever emotions arise with that. We ought to, right? But we should then draw our attention to what did we do rather than what's my nature as a human being, right? And, um, and, and generally, um, ironically as well, the reason that we take, you know, we behave in a way that we're not happy about for example, is normally because of our self-issues and self-concerns got in the way. They get in the way of us just seeing clearly and, and more objectively and less selfishly, right? Yeah. And so, it, 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 but it's not evidence that there's something wrong with us. It's evidence that um, this constantly generating sense of self and selfishness gets in the way of our actual nature which you know if you think about it our actual nature just wants to relax and enjoy people and enjoy experience you know and you watch kids that's that's our natural nature and that's still our natural nature so again it's a subtle distinction drawing between doing and being Yep. And, you know, and that's where the self-compassion thing is so important. When you recognise, you know, most most of the time we don't mean to be um, bad people, right? It, it's pretty unconscious and it, it's it's habit and, it, 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 and it's driven by s- strong feelings. And uh, th- so the second part of self-compassion... Um, is is this is this sense in which you know we recognize we're just a human being and we've got these design features and uh you know and we're going to learn from it we're going to behave differently in the future but it's not proof as i said that, that i'm a bad person yeah all right guys uh I, I, I'm left with the feeling that there's more to be said, of course, on this. It's a very, very, very large topic. Um, and uh, so I'm sure, I'll, I'm sure I'll come back to it. Um, but I'm very grateful uh, for, for your insights, especially in that they've raised questions in my mind uh, and I'll take those away. And um, so I look forward to our next time together. I'm not sure what our topic will be, um, but I wish you well. And I wish you well in, you know, unimproving, you know, get out there and just be. Okay, guys, I'll take, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.